well, because we're in church and confession is good for the soul, I must confess that I had to pick the scripture and the sermon title uh, before I went away to Louisville this week and had a chance to think about the sermon and the scripture passage. Um, I titled my sermon The Most Important Thing, and the scripture passage I picked was from Mark, and it's about the passage with the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know, go and sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And he goes away, the only person in the Bible that goes away from Jesus, unhappy. So I thought, maybe I should not preach the next to my last sermon here at Starmount about the most important thing being stewardship and selling all you have and giving it to the poor, as important as that, in fact, may be for your lives of faith. So instead, I'm going to be reading a different scripture than Mark, uh, and I'm going to be reading from um, Genesis. It's a story um, from the Jacob series, uh, and it's part of Jacob's life. Uh, when he wrestled with someone through the night uh, in the desert. So let us listen now for God's word as we can find it on, in Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. And Jacob's hip socket was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then God asked him, please tell me your name. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Here ends the scripture readings for us for this morning. May God add a blessing to our hearing and understanding of God's holy word. Well, today is Kirkin of the Tartan Sunday service here at Starmount. It is our congregation's annual nod to our Scottish heritage of the Presbyterian Church USA. It's the day to remember that the spiritual ancestors of our Presbyterian flavor of Christianity hailed primarily from the lowlands and highlands of Scotland. They were mostly poor, scrappy subsistence farmers who insisted that they be free to govern themselves as they saw fit and to worship as they pleased. And these proud Scotsmen and women would fight with, push against, subvert, and wrestle any power that sought to deny this freedom of governance and faith. To this end, the Scots were continually wrestling with the English crown and the English church as foreign invaders, oppressors of the worst kind. Today is also the next to the last time that I will stand here in this pulpit as your pastor and wrestle with what it means to hear God's word and do it. Wrestle with how to conform our lives to the image of Jesus Christ. Wrestle with faith and with spirituality, belief and unbelief as Christ followers in the 21st century. And so as we begin our time together, I want you to ask yourselves the following question. 
when did you learn to wrestle with ideas, with yourself, with God? And as you think about this question, I want you to consider the story of another wrestler. Jacob, from our Bible story this morning, knew how to wrestle, didn't he? Turns out Jacob would wrestle just about anybody who showed up. It all started in the womb. Jacob was a kind of superhero in utero, wrestling his twin brother Esau in their mother's belly before he had ever entered the world. Jacob even entered the world clinging to his brother's heel, a sure sign of things to come. In fact, Jacob's name means heel, and he turned out to be one, at least for a while. He spent his life wrestling, clawing, actually, for his brother's birthright and his father's blessing, for the woman named Rachel, and yes, even for grace, although this last thing was a long time in coming. Do you remember Jacob's story? Jacob, having cheated his brother, conned his father, and used his mother, finds himself all along in the wilderness, exiled from family and home, scared that his twin brother Esau will find him and take revenge. But God, not Esau, finds Jacob and claims Jacob as his own. Jacob dreams of ladders and angels and receives the promise of God's blessing on himself and his descendants. It's a real strange choice, Jacob. You'd think any self-respecting God would give this little liar exactly what he deserved, would fry him with judgment right there in the desert. But instead, God chooses Jacob and promises to look out after this heel. Even self-centered Jacob knows that something significant has happened. Surely the Lord was in this place, he says at Bethel, and I knew it not. From then on, Jacob wrestles with God. For Jacob is incessantly dense about what it means to be claimed by faith, to be in relationship with the God of the universe. Jacob makes his way to the home of his uncle Laban, who tricks Jacob into 14 years of work for two marriage licenses. Remember how Jacob fell for Laban's beautiful daughter, Rachel, and agrees to work for her father for seven years to secure her hand. He did the work, and they had the wedding, and the bride was covered in a full-length veil. Only when Jacob drew back the veil, he discovered, as the Bible says discreetly, in the morning, it was Leah, Rachel's older and homely sister. Love undaunted, Jacob worked another seven years for his beloved Rachel. Laban taught Jacob to wrestle. Father-in-laws can do that. In today's story, Jacob gathers up his wives and extended family, and he heads back to Canaan where it all began, still dragging all the dysfunctional baggage of his less-than-perfect past. At the crossing place on the river Jabbok, He is forced to confront his past and the person of Brother Esau, whose desert cartel is hot on his heels. Much afraid and distressed, the Bible tells us, Jacob prepares to face his twin brother who has sworn to kill him. Ever the wheeler dealer, Jacob sends some livestock ahead as a bride. But he also calls upon God, confessing, I'm not worthy of all the true and steadfast love which you've shown to me and your servant. Apparently, Jacob's growing up a bit. And in the night, he wrestles with the stranger who finds him by the river. They struggle till daybreak in quest of another blessing. Jacob wrestles the stranger and he prevails. And who is the stranger? Well, there are a lot of theories that abound. Some think the stranger was a night spirit prowling in the darkness, or maybe Jacob's brother Esau slipping up on him to settle the old scores. Still others imagine the stranger to be God who found Jacob in the desert long before. 
And still others imagine that Jacob was simply wrestling with himself, struggling in the darkness with his own shadow side. Whoever or whatever the stranger was that wrestled Jacob, it touched Jacob. And it threw his hip joint out and got him a new name. Suddenly, Jacob, the trickster, becomes Israel, which means God prevails. Esau, too, had come of age, it seems, and in the morning, the feuding brothers are reconciled. So why would I want to share the Jacob story on Kirkin of the Tartan Sunday, on my next to the last time in the pulpit here at Starnock? Well, I'm sharing this story with you because I want you to understand what I find to be the most important thing about faith and life. The biblical truth that I hope that you will hear and hold on to far after I am no longer your pastor. You see, the truth is that life is a wrestling match. Faith is a wrestling match, too, for that matter. To live by faith is to wrestle with any and everything that comes along. Like Jacob, you and I are ever wrestling with strangers and brothers, sisters and parents, enemies and friends, and occasional night spirits, and certainly wrestling with ourselves. The truth is that we never know when we may wind up all alone at some riverbank in some God-forsaken wilderness with destiny and danger all around, when the things we thought that would hold forever begin to fall apart. We never know when the times will take a turn and suddenly we are face-to-face with our deepest fears and our darkest doubts. And at such moments, you and I had better know how to wrestle, how to struggle until the morning and how to hold on to grace. We religious types declare that God and gospel will take away all struggles, right all wrongs, reconcile all differences, and end all conflict. Truth is, faith may get us into more trouble than we bargained for, adding complexity to life and relationships. Jacob wrestles at the river Jabbok and gets a blessing. Jesus wrestles in the Garden of Gethsemane and gets a cross. And only God knows which way it's going to go in the morning. So who in your life pushed you? Who challenged you? Who humbled you into wrestling with the complexity? Wrestling with life? And grace. Are there days when you come out of home or hospital room or funeral parlor or church with a knot in your stomach and aching in your head, not because you were rejecting faith or God or church, but because faith compelled you to confront something, struggle with something that confused or angered or invigorated or mystified or terrified you? Such struggles, personal and ethical and vocational and relational and familial and social and spiritual, you and I may never really be able to resolve. But knowing when to hold on and when to let go is one of the biggest questions of our existence. Well, after all these years of cheating people, Jacob finally learns that some things, even birthrights, are not worth having at somebody else's expense. At the river Jabbok, something simple and profound occurs before our very eyes. Jacob grows up. He finally takes responsibility for his actions, right and wrong. And then the story ends with this brief aside. And Jacob limped a little from then on. You see, wrestling strangers, enemies or friends, is a dangerous business. 
Some of the experiences mark us for life. In Ken Burns' documentary, Twain, we learn of a black woman named Mary Ann Court who for years cooked for Samuel Clemens' family at their summer vacation home in New York State. One evening after dinner, Twain remarked, Mary Ann, you seem a cheerful, hearty soul. How is it that you have lived your 60 years without any trouble? I've never seen your eye when it had no laugh in it. Has I had any trouble? Court asked. And then she told her story, which Mark Twain published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1874, renaming her Aunt Rachel. Reared a slave in Virginia, she married and had seven children, a family that held together until 1852 when all were sold away from her, including her youngest, Henry. When she resisted, her master warned, stop your damn blubbering, and hit her in the mouth. She lost all track of her family. Years later, as the Civil War was ending, Mary Ann Court, still enslaved, was working on a North Carolina plantation when a group of black Union troops occupied the area and asked her to bring them breakfast. She was taking a pan of biscuits from the oven when, as she said, I saw a black face come round under mine, and all of a sudden I knowed, boy, I said, if you ain't my Henry, the good Lord be praised. I got my own again. And then Mary Ann Court looked at Mark Twain and added, Oh, no, Mr. Clemens, I ain't had no trouble and no joy. Some wounds in life heal over, but the scar remains. And Jacob limped a little from then on. To live in this world means being broken, bruised, roughed up, considerably, one way or another. Earthen vessels, says St. Paul. You and I are God's precious earthen vessels that chip and crack and all too readily in this life, in its give and take, as we struggle with innocence and injustice, with hope and despair. But dear friends, if you and I, like Jacob or Jesus or Mary Ann Court, want to learn If we want to live, if we want to receive a blessing, we may get maimed for it. That's just how it is. Here or there, then or now, at the River Jabbok or in the Garden of Gethsemane, in a North Carolina slave kitchen on the way to emancipation, or in a pew during worship at Kirkin of the Tartan service at Starmount Presbyterian Church. So the last word from the story is the first word after all. When all is said and done, it's not just that you and I find God, but God finds us. At the river Jabbok, Jacob learned that he needed the grace of God's presence in his life, a gracious presence that had been there all along. You see, brothers and sisters, it turns out that we're all wrestling something. Struggling and hurting. Growing old and growing up. Conniving and repenting. Lying and loving. Arrogant and broken all at once. Wrestling, each and every one of us, with the eternal stranger the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, as it turns out, will not let us go. Cannot let us go until we receive a life-changing blessing. Turns out that even in the darkest night of our human struggle, there is God's presence. God's 
amazing grace. And that, my friends, is the most important thing. Thanks be to God. Amen.